You're listening to episode four of the Speakeasies podcast. Hope you guys enjoyed this one. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Speakeasies. Uh, my name is Kate Petrie. I'm one of your hosts. I'm Grady Johnson. And I'm Polo de los Santos. And I am very, very, very excited to be able to bring you guys something that I've been wanting to do for a long time, ever since we decided that we were going to start this podcast. I really wanted to do a dramatic reading of the Wikipedia page for the Great Emu War. Um, if you guys don't know what that is, that's fine, because you're going to get educated today. And it's generally just a fantastic time, as you know, probably. Emus are large, flightless Australian birds. and Almost like ostriches, the, correct? Almost like ostriches, that is correct. And But which one's better? I, I'm not here to talk about which one is better. I'm only here to talk about... It's like the alpaca to the ostriches llama. Yes, I guess. I'm just here to talk about, though. I am just here to talk about the Great Emu War. And I'm going to try to do my best uh, British-slash-Australian uh, documentary voice as I go through this. And I'm just going to be reading the Wikipedia page word for word since it is just it is just pure art. Anyway. Now, should we... Is this a read-along? I don't know. This is more, more, this is more of an audiobook, style. honestly, if I, can, if I can do this well. And okay. I think... I'm just going to sit back so we should sit, sit back. back and enjoy. Just, yes? just have a couple laughs. Okay. Teleported to okay. another time. It's you it's said October it? of 1932. Actually, no, it's not. Not yet. But, all right. Buckle in, guys. Following World War I, large numbers of ex-soldiers from Australia, along with a number of British veterans, took up farming within Western Australia, often in marginal areas. With the onset of the Great Depression in 1929, these farmers were encouraged to increase their wheat crops, with the government promising, and failing to deliver, assistance in the form of subsidies. In spite of the recommendations and the promised subsidies, wheat prices continued to fall, and by October of 1932, matters were becoming intense, with the farmers preparing to harvest the season's crop while simultaneously threatening to refuse to deliver the wheat. The difficulties facing farmers were increased by the arrival of as many as 20,000 emus. Emus regularly migrate after their breeding season, heading to the coast from the inland regions. With the cleared land and additional water supplies being made available for livestock by the West Australian farmers, the emus found that the cultivated lands were good habitat and they began to foray into farm territory. In particular, the marginal farming land around Chandler and Walgolan. The emus consumed and spoiled the crops as well as leaving large gaps in fences where rabbits could enter and cause further problems. Farmers relayed their concerns about the birds ravaging their crops, and a deputation of ex-soldiers were sent to meet with the Minister of Defence, Sir George Pearce. Having served in World War I, the soldier settlers were well aware of the effectiveness of machine guns, and they requested their deployment. The Minister readily agreed, although with conditions attached. The guns were to be used by military personnel, and troop transport was to be financed by the Western Australian government, and the farmers would provide food, accommodation, and payment for the ammunition. Pierce also supported the deployment on the grounds that the birds would make good target practice, although it has been argued since that some in the government may have viewed this as a way of being seen to be helping the Western Australian farmers, and towards that end, a cinematographer from Fox Movie Tone was enlisted. Military involvement was due to begin in October of 1932. The war was conducted under the command of Major G.P.W. Meredith of the 7th Heavy Battery of the Royal Australian Artillery, and with Meredith commanding soldiers Sergeant S. McMurray and Gunner J. O'Hallora, armed with two Lewis guns and 10,000 rounds of ammunition. The operation was delayed, however, by a period of rainfall that caused the emus to scatter over a wider area. The rain ceased by 2nd of November 1932, at which point the troops were deployed with orders to assist the farmers and, according to a newspaper account, to collect 100 emu skins so that their feathers could be used to make hats for light horsemen. On 2nd of November, the men travelled to Campion, where some 50 emus were sighted. As the birds were out of range of the guns, the local settlers attempted to herd the emus into an ambush, but the birds split into small groups and ran so that they were difficult to target. Nevertheless, 
While the first fusillade from the machine guns was ineffective due to the range, a second round of gunfire was able to kill a number of birds. Later the same day, a small flock was encountered, and perhaps a dozen birds were killed. The next significant event was on the 4th of November. Meredith had established an ambush near a local dam, and more than 1,000 emus were spotted heading towards their position. This time the gunners waited until the birds were in close proximity before opening fire. The gun jammed after only 12 birds were killed and the remainder scattered before any more could be shot. No more birds were sighted that day. In the days that followed, Meredith chose to move further south where the birds were reported to be fairly tame, but there was only limited success in spite of his efforts. By the fourth day of the campaign, army observers noted that each pack seems to have its own leader now, a big black plumed bird which stands fully six feet high and keeps watch while his mates carry out their work of destruction and warns them of our approach. At one stage, Meredith even went so far as to mount one of the guns on a truck, a move that proved to be ineffective, as the truck was unable to gain on the birds, and the ride was so rough that the gunner was unable to fire any shots. By the 8th of November, six days after the first engagement, 2,500 rounds of ammunition had been fired. The number of birds killed is uncertain. One account estimates that it was 50 birds, but other accounts range from 200 to 500, the latter figure being provided by the settlers. Meredith's official report noted that his men had suffered no casualties. Summarizing the culls, ornithologist Dominic Severanti commented, The machine gunner's dreams of point-blank fire into serried masses of emus were soon dissipated. The emu command had evidently ordered guerrilla tactics, and its unwieldy army soon split up into innumerable small units that made use of the military equipment uneconomic. A crestfallen field force therefore withdrew from the combat area after about a month. On the 8th of November, representatives in the Australian House of Representatives discussed the operation. Following the negative coverage of events in the local media they, that included claims that only a few emus had died, Pierce withdrew the military personnel and the guns on the 8th of November. After the withdrawal, Major Meredith compared the emus to Zulus and commented on the striking maneuverability of the emus, even while badly wounded. Quote, if we had a military division with the bullet-carrying capacity of these birds, it would face any army in the world. They can face machine guns with the invulnerability of tanks. They are like Zulus, whom even dum-dum bullets could not stop. After the withdrawal of the military, the emu attacks on crops continued. Farmers again asked for support, citing the hot weather and drought that brought emus invading farms in their thousands. James Mitchell, the Premier of Western Australia, lent his strong support to renewal of the military assistance. At the same time, a report from the base commander was issued that indicated 300 emus had been killed in the initial operation. Acting on the requests and the base commander's report, by the 12th of November, the Minister of Defence approved a resumption of military efforts. He defended the decision in the Senate, explaining why soldiers were necessary to combat the serious agricultural threats of the large emu population. Although the military had le agreed to lend the guns to the Western Australian government on the expectation that they would provide the necessary people, Meredith was once again placed in the field due to an apparent lack of experienced machine gunners in the state. Taking to the field on the 13th of November of 1932, the military found a degree of success over the first two days, with approximately 40 emus killed. The third day, the 15th of November, proved to be far less successful. But by the 2nd of December, the soldiers were killing approximately 100 emus per week. Meredith was recalled on the 10th of December, and in his report, he claimed 986 kills with exactly 9,860 rounds at a rate of exactly 10 rounds per confirmed kill. In addition, Meredith claimed 2,500 wounded birds had died as a result of the injuries that they had sustained. Despite the problems encountered with the cull, the farmers of the region once again requested military assistance in 1934, 1943, and 1948, only to be turned down by the government. Instead, the bounty system that had been instigated in 1923 was continued, and this proved to be effective. 57,034 bounties were claimed over a six-month period in 1934. By December of 1932, word of the Emu War had spread, reaching the UK, some conservationists there protested the cull as an extermination of the rare emu. Dominic Severanti, an eminent Australian ornithologist, described the war as an attempt at the mass destruction of the birds. Throughout 1930 and onward, exclusion barrier fencing became a popular means of keeping emu out of agricultural areas, in addition to other vermin such as dingoes and rabbits. Here concludes the broadcast. That was beautiful. I had to weep.
I had to weep. You're welcome. So I, I really tried hard for that one. That was beautiful. I'm sorry, Grady. But I just read that Wikipedia page once and thought it was... Where can I find... Where can I find more of your work, Cade? <laughs> My work? This is this is the only work that I have ex- exclusively. Exclusive to the Speakeasies podcast. You heard that. You heard that right, folks? I don't know if I feel bad for the emus or for the people. Because it's like... Look, I'm probably going to make a lot of people mad by saying this. But I think we need some controversy every now and again. It's like, okay. I feel bad for the emus because, of course... You know, they were hunted or whatever. But it's like, oh, wait, they're emus? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Now, see, I think... Th- Is that a crime? See, I think that's because the emus must be inferior to the ostrich. I, I really just think it's because they were just killing crops, Polo. I'm just going to be completely yeah, we, honest we here. We discussed before the reading, all right? Okay. No. All right. That cannot be the only reason. Listen, I refuse to believe that. If if we're going to take away anything from this, I really thought that that quote, the actual quote, by the way, that if militarizing emus could face any army in the world, I think, honestly, we have to agree that emus are superior to ostriches. They can take 10 rounds before dying, man, from a machine gun, no less. It's honestly incredible. I don't think I'm prepared to have a almond cashew-esque debate about emus and ostriches. Same. I've never, you know, I've never had a close relationship with either. But what I will say is that I've driven past an emu farm in central California. See, I have never actually seen an emu or an ostrich in real life. What are they like, out of curiosity? They are birds. They are yeah, large. So the pictures really do them justice. You large, know? flightless you know birds. People are like, "Oh, you know, you got to see them in real life." So, yeah, they really do. <clears throat> All right. Well, if you guys ever want to uh, enjoy the magic of the emu war again, I just read the Wikipedia page word for word. It truly, was a work of art. I think now. No. Oh, talking ahead. about all these ostriches and emus, I think they're great animals. But on to a suggestion from one of our listeners, Leslie Chang. We'd like to discuss which animal is the cutest. What do you guys think it is? Cute animals is a subjective term. No, this is not subjective, Cade. It's objective? Yes. There is only one right answer, and the right answer is penguins. Okay? Is there a specific type of penguin you had in mind? The emperor penguin, and specifically emperor penguins... Of the young age. Like, from the movie Happy Feet? That is the only correct answer. I don't know. Have you guys ever seen an anglerfish? An anglerfish? <laughs> yeah. It's it's charming in its own way. <laughs> yeah, you know, oh, when yeah. I think adorable, I think anglerfish. <laughs> I think oh, of yeah. large, scary teeth. I think of a light. Who wouldn't want to cuddle one of those? Face. And know? I think of that scene yeah. from Finding Nemo. <laughs> who wouldn't want to come okay wait hear me out i know it sounds crazy but hear me out um so of course the face of an angler fish is horrifying it's like oh why would anybody think that's adorable but it's like it's got this little light that's just coming off its forehead and it's totally not proportional it's like like what's going on there i think we have to agree to disagree if the light is the only redeeming physical feature of the anglerfish then i don't think we can classify it as cute i was just certainly not the cutest in the animal kingdom and another thing if, if we're talking about which animal is the cutest i think we just have to go with the animal like polo said emperor penguins but specifically at a young age i don't think we can specify an age because Pretty much anything can be classified as the cutest when it's at a young age. Like You're right. puppies. You're right. Those are cute, but they're young. You know? Maybe when they grow up, some people don't think they're cute. You know, the same as with yeah, my dog. But my dog looks like a puppy and he's grown old. In fact he's in the room right now. Okay. Then I, I everybody say hi to Hamilton. Hello, Hamilton. Hello, Hamilton. Well then I re- I revoke my statement, Cade. Okay. So I now want to make the argument. No, not argument. State the facts that the rabbit is the cutest. 
animal. Okay. But consider this. Or bunny. Pangolins. P-A-N-G-O-L-I-N-S. Pangolins. I want you to look at it. It kind of looks like a cross between an armadillo and an anteater and a monkey. Ooh, that makes me uncomfortable. But it truly is adorable. Yeah, no, no, okay. Why? Wrong. Incorrect answer. Really? Then I guess we're being subject subjective about it. I don't think we can be objective. Exactly. Here's, you have to think about the context. Like, if you found one of these in your room, I would freak out. I'm not going to lie. I think if I saw this in my room, I'd be more freaked out than if I saw a bear in my room. Here's why. Bears, I'm assuming, are much more ferocious, right? But there's no way that I would ever miss a bear being in my room. It's like there's nowhere it can hide. But it's like if I, I could go to sleep and then all of a sudden I feel this weird reptilian scaly thing walking all over my bed. I'm like, that is not my dog. I would lose it. But you're telling me you wouldn't lose it if you were sleeping in your bed and you felt this huge paw and just about a ton, literally one ton of fur and claws I would, pushing down on you and you wouldn't be freaked out. You'd think that was your I dog. Think I think that would never happen because I would always know if there's a bear in my room. But this thing could hide under my bed. That's horrifying. Now, CK, if, if that was to happen with a bear just in your room for some strange reason i think it would have already killed you if if you felt it now if if you can still feel it after maybe 30 seconds then it must mean that it is not aggressive that's true so so it must be okay but actually now i take back my whole anglerfish thing because if there is an anglerfish flopping around in my room in you know, I would be freaked I mean, out. I'd I'd be very concerned actually. I would I would let's just agree that if we were to find random animals in our room, we would be concerned slightly. No, I would not be concerned if a bunny was to just jump into my room. I would be I'd glad. be slightly concerned. Where, no, I would not be mom? concerned at all. Where, how did you get in my room? My door is locked. Don't can this bunny I, pick up? Don't locks? ask. That, don't ask. That is a whole different conversation that we need to be having. Should we um create genetically engineered rabbits to be spies no it's genius no <laughs> job security i just said that as a joke the jo job security for spies is i now i'm picturing a whole protest with a bunch of people wearing masks and hoodies and it's just this little red line through a bunny and now i'm kind of sad but think about anyway but if a penguin were to oh. show up in my room i wouldn't really be I don't know. I, w I probably wouldn't freak out. I mean, I'd be confused. Exactly. But I wouldn't like. I wouldn't lose my mind. Like if I saw a, a pangolin. And I wouldn't lose my mind over a pangolin. Really? It I looks think, like oh, a dinosaur. Neat. Or a dragon. Yeah. A cute, small armadillo-looking dinosaur. That does not look small. This thing it looks, looks massive. small. It's like two feet long. That's kind of yeah. Small. It could probably eat my dog. <laughs> Do you see the size of its mouth? I mean, if it took its time. And look how tame it looks. It just looks tame, you know? No. It looks tame to me. Guys, are you serious? I am. Okay. I think I think something we can agree on is that... Why would it be small? It said the giant what? pangolin. It mu cannot okay, well, be small. Okay, well, let's find the other pangolin, the smaller pangolin. Also, I think we can agree that usually the cuteness of something is directly related to directly in proportion to the size of that object an inverse relationship as the size goes down no the that's false goes up why no i would Wait, what about an orangutan I will present to you what an orangutan oh those are they're, those they're are not cute. they're not cute like yeah, they are. like i appreciate orange orangutans but it's not cute to me no like you look at it, you're like oh that's so no so, uh, too so silly that's so ridiculous now to prove Cade's statement i could never take you serious i'm, I'm just gonna prove Cade's statement completely wrong here a spider is very small uh a spider is not cute okay 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 i yeah okay spiders are horrible i hate spiders okay polo i i accept that let's go with mammals i think 
maybe it's like a bell cur- what, as a mammal like a gets cur- smaller relationship as a mammal gets smaller it becomes more cute. mammals okay mammals like capybaras small capybaras those are cute big capybaras are cute too what about a possum uh you know once again we come to the point that this is just subjective and there's no point in arguing about it i'll concede the capybara is pretty nice and we just all have our different opinions the capybara is a fantastic animal polo is currently looking for creepy small animals mammals okay i have i have not been able to find one i think While we can't find a definitive answer, which I think there is a definitive definitive answer, and that is a rabbit. I disagree. Anyway, I think you we can create a guideline as to finding one. And I think cuteness is related to vulnerability, okay? You were talking about the pangolin. It has freaking scales on it, man. It, it cannot be that vulnerable. I'm telling you, like I feel like I feel like okay, it has so some secrets. Orangutans like, fight all the time. Those aren't vulnerable. Well then, they're disqualified. They're disqualified. Fine. But wait, hear me out. Even like if it was a tame if it, excuse me, if it was a tame orangutan, I would be fine with that. But even if I had a, a tame um pangolin, was it? A pangolin. That would be I'd still be afraid. Yeah. Like even a tame pangolin. No, get out of my house. But an orangutan, I would let it walk around. Like that would be funny. Maybe See, not man. cute. It, it com- it's funny. completely the opposite for me. I can walking downtown with your pet it's orangutan. Making my way downtown. You'd be the walking fast. You'd be the talk of the orangutan town. Orangutan passes, and I'm homebound. You know how many people would run in opposite directions if they saw me walking with a pangolin? Not many. Not many, Grady. Yeah, probably. Okay, probably. See, it kind of looks like the armadillo monkey combo. And people think monkeys are cool. And people think armadillos are cute. So I really don't see the problem. What about a, a proboscis monkey? Oh. Let's Let's look that up. A proboscis monkey. Interesting. <clears throat> but what does it look like? It looks like it has a penis on its face. It's just the most... <laughs> and that's not cute to me. I'm just going to go out and say it. <laughs> You're right. It's not. I don't know. I, th- I think you need to look this up. For yourself, Kate. Like you said, it's subjective. <sighs> Probuscus. Probuscus. Monkey. Probuscus. Probuscus. It, yeah, that's not cute to me. That's just, like, I look at it and I feel pity for it. It's probably, I, it's I, probably pretty vulnerable. No one would ever love that. Pr- pretty, <laughs> I, yeah. I don't love it. Oh, that's so sad. It, it just... It looks weird. It looks like... And apparently it's threatened, which is sad. In this picture, it looks like there's a squashed bell pepper on his face. But it's its nose. Hmm. That's not cute. I'm Yeah, I know I suggested that, but that's not cute. I'm sorry. I'm sorry you guys had to see that. Yeah, great. Yeah, I think we should just move on before we get deeper into Proboscis Monkey World, which is... Just so okay. depressing, honestly, was... even though I've been looking at it for like 30 seconds. Like, I mean, I don't know. I think, I feel like, honestly, the penguin is pretty solid. Only because it matches all the criteria. You're right. Well, if it's an emperor penguin, that's, those things are, are pretty big. I mean. Yeah, they're, and, and pretty regal. Ah, puns. Yeah. Uh, you know what? That's funny. Um, Guys... I think I have something else to talk about. I, j- I was just looking at my desk. And let's talk about brand apparel. Why does it matter to wear things with the name of the brand on the shirt or on, on the bag? 
because this is something that I've legitimately never understood. I'll see a cool t-shirt and I'll like pick it up and be like, wow, that's a cool t-shirt. And then I'll see like a huge brand like on, on the, uh, on the chest or on the back and I'll think, but why, why do I want this? It's actually just getting in the way of the design and the coolness of the shirt for me. But then you see other people just walking around like, yeah, man, this shirt's from this guy. And you wonder what makes them do that. Discuss. Well, you know, it's all about our um, our human sense of value, right? I mean, it it's like a... It's essentially a status symbol, I think. I mean, I, I'm with you, Cade. When I see a, a shirt or something... I just do it based off of like the design and a lot of my shirts don't really have like a big logo across it because I I don't really like the look of that unless it's like, unless it's like going for that, you know what I'm saying? Like a retro shirt that's like supposed to look like an old shirt with a logo on it or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I think it's just a sort of a status thing. Because it's like, oh, you know, I uh, yeah, I, okay, I bought this, okay. and you know how that. much this was just by looking at the logo. It's like you're paying for the name. You're paying for the name. See, but see, like, I don't know how much it was, and and what if it's just like, like, what if it's not even just a brand of clothing? Let's just say it's clothing that has a brand on it. Like, I get a shirt that says Coca Cola, like. I get what you're talking about. I'd totally buy a shirt that said Coca-Cola if it was a, a cool retro logo. But people with just shirts that just just wear shirts that just say Coke just on them, I, I just don't get it. I think sometimes I think people actually genuinely like the product. Like if I were to get a shirt that said Orange Fanta, if I saw that, I would get it because I like Orange Fanta or Peach Fanta. But um, that's beyond the point. I guess some people just like the look of it because I know because I'm thinking I once bought a Coke shirt I think if I remember yeah I have a Coke shirt and now that I think about it I don't know particularly why I got it I guess I just thought it looked kind of cool because the Coca-Cola logo in itself is, is pretty aesthetically pleasing but um, it is kind of it's like you know Coke loves it it's like oh we got free advertising here um so we'll we'll go with that, but um yeah, that's true. But I don't, I don't know. Perhaps you know. Perhaps we're living in a material world, and I am a material girl. <laughs> Madonna. I think that's gonna become a running gag if we if we don't if we aren't careful, Grady. But no, I like it. Throw no. caution to the wind. Um, Polo, what what do you have any like brand shirts that you wear and why? I'm just not sure. Probably. Most, most definitely. Now, when when I and my family go out, you know, to go clothes shopping, we do look for those, those brands. I'm no sh- no shame, but the reason why is because usually those brands have some sort of, uh, they have some trust to them. You know, we can trust the quality, can trust their their sourced responsibly sometimes you know and they're not going to rip on you or break on you like the next time you wear it and that's mostly why you know like i get i get shopping for brands for for like quality like i i have a couple brands that i go to but usually when i get shirts from them i i don't like the logo to be visible i have one shirt it's just this maroon t-shirt and like i like it because the quality is nice it feels nice on my skin and maroon is a good color for me and the brand it's just literally this tiny emblem that almost blends in with the fabric right on the right shoulder and i love that shirt but i'll still buy it for for the quality of the brand it's just yeah. not to display the brand yeah well i think maybe i just thought of this so a lot of brands especially with clothing i think are associated with a certain lifestyle i guess like i think active is a like a surf skateboard sort of deal yeah definitely and so maybe they like to the customers like that because like oh this is sort of 
shows the kind of person I am. Because if you like skating or whatever, you know, um, you would say, oh, well, I really like their products and I really like their company as a whole. So I, I, I appreciate this shirt and I'll buy it with their logo. It's like the same reason why people buy shirts with bands on them or or anything because they support whatever it is is on the shirt yeah now i think maybe k what Cade was talking about before was just like large brands like the shirt maker on the shirt is that is that how i am i ter- interpreting that correctly Cade? Let, let's just go to an extreme example supreme hoodies I have never worn a Supreme hoodie. But do you want to? I will never wear a Supreme hoodie. I don't want to. It's just like I get I get what Grady was saying about the lifestyle, but I think it's also value signaling when you wear a shirt with a brand on it. Like when I see a guy wearing Supreme, I either know that one, there's a 50% chance that it's fake because those things are expensive. Or two, that this guy cares about looking good, looking like just showing off that he has money for some reason. Because I don't know if our listeners have seen the prices those shirts go for, but the hoodies with Supreme can go upwards of three grand easily that I've seen. And like, like I look at it online and I just think, oh, that looks like a fine hoodie. The red and white combo is nice. And it's just got this one word Supreme right in it. It's a nice minimalist design, but I would not buy that for three grand. So I think the only reason somebody would is just to show, oh man, look at you plebs without money and look at me, I have money. And I, I guess other brands can fit into that in a certain way. Yeah, yeah definitely. Like, like I have, you know, my mom likes to go shopping, right? So I have quite a lot of clothes I don't like. But there's some like certain brands that I've apparently learned, I've learned that apparently are very high qual- high priced high quality apparently and honestly some of the sometimes they're just a pain to wear you know you might be showing off but they're just not worth it you know you're just gonna you're willing to die for the style yeah some people are like that i think but... i think it's not too hard to um sort of understand the the point of view of someone buying a like a so we're talking about supreme and how it's really expensive well think about like go back to the days of like the monarchy in France Ooh. and when they would just have portraits just just so they could they do all these things where they could show off just to show how much money they have i mean versailles palace was i don't even know how much it costed in total to make that but it was it was all aesthetic it it was it, it was insane man have you been there because I have. It's it's incredible, though. It is really incredible to look at. I think almost wearing clothing is almost like a subdued version of that. I think this brings into another discussion that may be a little bit deeper. Why do people want to signal their values to other people? And why why do they choose to do that? Like, Like, I'm a private person. I don't talk to people that much until I'm really good friends with them. And then you know what I value because I talk about it. But why would I wear something on on the outside just right away? I think for some people, it's it's more of like, I don't have, I don't want to talk to you, but I still want you to know my values and like what I'm about. So wearing something like that signals who you are your values without having to make like a connection you know and it's um maybe to a certain extent it's just for themselves right i mean oh yeah oh yeah i guess they care enough about it that they want to show this to the world i mean i'm thinking right now i'm wearing an la galaxy jersey and um i mean i guess i'm sort of like you kid i don't really immediately tell people everything i value off the top of just after meeting them but I mean, LA Galaxy, that's that's a considerably big thing for me. And I like to sort of show that I support that. And it's sort of helpful, too, because sometimes, you know, I see people walking down the street with an LA Galaxy jersey. I'm like, oh, hey, cool, you know, did you see the game or whatever? And we can, we can have a conversation, honestly, 
and I've done that before with people that I've seen wearing the jersey, and people have done that to me. And so um, I think, to a certain, at least for like sports, it's almost like a community thing. I guess we could maybe even translate that to not not even just for sports, just for the greater thing. It's I guess it's the constant desire of people to find people like them and find people that they connect to. And you can't just go up to everybody and just ask them, hey, like with your example, hey, do you like the LA Galaxy? Can we talk about that? But if you see somebody wearing a shirt, you can be like, oh, well, that person likes LA Galaxy. Or if you see somebody driving a, a classic car or something, you know that they appreciate classic cars and you can you can connect with them over that. I guess maybe it's just showing that humans are humans are superficial sometimes, but we can use superficiality to create deeper connections within our community. I think that's a sort of um, a, a, a darker way to, to look at it, but I think maybe we could just say humans are also um, a very communal species. You know, we like to, we like to, of course, we like to create relationships with one another and um, we like to be an, around one another. But I think we do like to be around typically people that are more like us just because um, it sort of stems from that idea of the fear of the unknown because it's just, you know, you can expect this and you know what you can talk about and stuff like that. And so I think. I think it, it's sort of a reflection of how we like to be yeah. sort of tribal in a certain sense. You know what I'm saying? And I think that that goes beyond just clothes too, you know, I like items. Like you, you said before, the car, like classic cars, but really everything, you know, if you're, I mean, maybe this is a bit much, but like if you have an iPhone, you know, immediately, you know, other people that are like somewhat like you have an iphone too but then you see other people who have a samsung for example and, and you think oh they're trying to go against the grain maybe or they're trying to be different in some sort of way yeah we like to be clicky about certain things i guess we can we can identify people who are like us and by extension people who are unlike us it fosters division and unity yeah hmm. and like like for me for me personally you know like i i like photography i have a a camera and whenever i see people on the street with a camera i think oh they must like taking pictures too you know maybe we have something in common there or especially if they have a sony camera you know i'm like oh well they truly appreciate good technology you know sony please sponsor us definitely so it's it's interesting so do you ever find yourself like getting into a conversation with people over photography that you, you never really know? You wouldn't talk to otherwise if you didn't see them with the camera? Honestly, I haven't, but I think part of that's just my personality. You know, I don't like talking to people. And that's it goes back to the thing about like, I don't like talking to people about my personal life, but I would want to show it, you know, without having to say <laughs> like, I have that thing, and I want to. I want to broadcast. Hey, I like it's it's imaging. It's a different know? form of communication. Yeah, is what you're saying. Yeah, and I think in a world where there's just so many, so much more people and rapid forms of communication, you know, I think that's how it's going to be. We don't have time to explain. Hey, I like doing this. My 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 passion is this. You know, that's why we have, that's probably why we, we have all these brands and we focus so much on telling other people what we're about in that way. It's just society. Yeah. I think, I think that's true to some extent. And I think I just, I, th I like to go back to the fact that it's um, sort of an easy identifier, if you will. Um, it's just a good way of, of sparking up conversation 
or uh, friendship to a certain extent. I mean, even if I don't necessarily agree with or like pull, you're talking about photography and how if you see someone walking around with a camera, you're like, oh, I, I can see that they appreciate photography in the same way that I do. Well, I personally am not a photographer, but if I were to see someone walk down with a camera, then I could, I too could say, oh, um, I can see that person likes photography. And that's a, that's a, a segue of conversation that I could take with that person. And yeah. so it's really helpful to a certain extent, I think. And I, I appreciate it. Cause if we were all wearing, you know, monotone clothing, like some of the stuff that I wear is just pretty basic. doesn't mean anything, but like, if everyone wore that, then you're like, oh, well, I don't really know where to go with this person because I don't know what they support, what they what they enjoy. And so, you know, but I mean, hey, it's weird how much of how, how much we are as individuals is also related so much to how much we identify with other groups. You know, my individual style just the the way I roll, you know, is based so much off of how uh, how uh, of the the people that I hang out with and the brands that I buy, and I think that's interesting. How to become an individual, we have to identify with a combination of groups and other people when in their individuality have to identify with other groups. Why can't we all just get along, man? I'm sorry. Who knows. Maybe people just buy it because they like the shirt. You know? That's how it is with me. And I think there's been good talk. We've had good talks. We opened up with uh, with the Great Emu War, which was which was moving, really. Thank you. And Thank then you. we, uh, very we transitioned. We kept on that animalistic theme. We were talking about cutest animals. when, And no one really came to a conclusion. We do know that we don't like the proboscis monkey. Or the anglerfish. Well, okay. Anything. Yeah. Or the anglerfish. Angler if anything is conclusive, it is those yes. two. Uh, we want to thank uh, fellow listener Leslie Chang for that suggestion. It was a good, a good suggestion for, for good conversation. And we want to uh, impress upon you to keep suggesting those topics. Um, we, we don't promise to include all the ones that are suggested, but we do promise to definitely consider them and try to work it into our episodes. So we really appreciate it when you guys suggest different topics. And so um, I think with that, we are getting close to the end here. Um, do you guys have any wrapping up statements that you want to say to the audience? Make sure you tell our, your friends about us. We're on iTube, YouTube, and Podbean. iTube, iTunes, iTunes, YouTube, and Podbean. If if iTube existed, we'd be on it too, but we don't. So iTunes, YouTube, and Podbean releases every Friday. Make sure to tell your friends. If you enjoy this, make sure to keep leaving those suggestions for us in YouTube comments uh, on uh, the int- Instagram DMs and uh, on Podbean. Yep, just make sure to stay active in the Speakeasies community, the small yet active one. I feel like we have a cult following, yeah. and I'm fine with that. And a following's uh... a following. <laughs> something like that but um all right thanks for listening thanks for hopefully enjoying the show and look out for next week's episode